Hello again, it's the Ohio Ram Show coming to you from Southwest Ohio. And tonight we have uh, a guest coming from Illinois, came all the way from Germany, but is in Illinois now, uh, Martin Grubola. I hope I got that pronounced right. He'll get me corrected. But this is a show about cycling, ultra cycling, and the race across America, sponsored by Time Stations 41 in Oxford, Ohio, and 42 in Blanchester, Ohio. And I am your host, Lee Kreider. Um, my lighting looks a little strange tonight because of some jerry rigging I had to do, but uh, we're here. And we want to go out to Illinois and say hello to Martin Grubala. Do I have that name right, Martin? You do indeed. And I say hello to everyone. <laughs> well, we're glad to have you here. And uh, Martin, you are a Ram veteran and a team, and you go under the um, moniker of the Honey Badger. How did you come up with that? Yeah, the Honey Badger. So I didn't come up with that. It's a couple of friends of mine on, on our cycling team here at Wildcard. What happened is, uh, you know, there was a couple, maybe two or three years ago or whatever, there was this video going viral of a honey badger uh, and on YouTube. You know, the honey badger doesn't care. The honey badger always gets back up and so forth. <laughs> and uh, I go to Vietnam once in a while on, on trips and they do have cobra there to eat. And so I, I have actually eaten cobra. And I guess this is one of those things that honey badgers are supposed to eat. But on the top of that, a, a few years back, I was doing a... Uh, um, uh, Ironman race and I crashed on the bike ride and broke some ribs but I just got back on the bike took, took some pain pills finished the bike ride and then ran a marathon afterwards and then I checked into the emergency tin and so when my buddies found out they said okay you're the honey badger so that's where that came from <laughs> well my wife loves that video she showed it she used to watch it over and over again her and our daughter-in-law they would rice it, rat, uh, watch it and just crack up something awful. Well, Martin, uh, tell me a little about yourself, uh, how you got to be in Illinois, and a little bit about uh, your family and what you do. Sure. I'm originally from uh, Germany, and my family moved around a fair bit. I lived in Austria. I went to a French school for a few years. We moved to Spain from there. I lived in uh, Malaga, in, at the southern end of Spain, for several years. And then uh, my parents retired to the U.S., and the whole family moved over here. My brother and sister also live in the States. My parents actually finally went back to Germany, so they live back in Berlin now, but all the children decided to stay. And uh, my younger brother is a computer scientist, my sister's a biologist, and uh, I ended up becoming a chemist, as in you know, chemical research. So, uh, uh, you know, I studied at various places in the US, including at, at Berkeley, where I got my PhD degree, and uh, looked around for faculty position in various places and got a professor uh, offer uh, at various places, including the University of Illinois, and I liked uh, you know the place here best. Really great support, a, a great place to do research, and that's why I decided to come here. And I've been doing this for 23 years. So I've been a scientist at the University of Illinois for 23 years. Lots of graduate students coming through, and we're doing research in a variety of different areas in chemistry. And you've been here long enough that in the race across America, you're flying the American flag. I see. I am indeed flying the American flag. I've got it on my jersey, and I became a citizen of the United States in 2004. A little bit ahead of my wife, Nancy. Maybe we'll get her on the show a little bit later on. Uh, the two of us actually met at Berkeley while we were in grad school. Uh, I, we were both PhD students there. Well, I hope we do get her on here in a little bit. Now, before we went on the air, Martin, we were talking and I read your uh, CV here of what it is you do, which I don't understand. And I told you, <clears throat> we talked about the Ig Nobel Awards that they have uh, for strange uh, scientific research projects. And on the award show, the people are asked to explain what they're about in seven words. I told you I wouldn't hold you to seven words, but can you give us an explanation that somebody like me could possibly understand what it is you do? Yeah, sure. I'll keep it short. Basically, you know, humans need proteins to survive. They're like the machinery inside our cells that do all of the work. They make the energy that we need. They're very important in sports, right? The muscle contraction, that's proteins contracting, all these sorts of things. And these uh, proteins have very specific three-dimensional structures. And what we try to figure out in our research is the process by which proteins fold up into these functioning structures. And when you use the word folding there, 
it reminded me, I listen to Science Friday and, and I think Science Times podcasts all the time. And they talked about using uh, crowd computing to help with this protein folding, which I don't know how you go about pro folding protein, but, well, I just show my ignorance by saying that. But uh, tell me a little bit about that crowd computing process. Yeah, so one of my uh, uh, colleagues at Stanford University, his name is Vijay Pandey, and I work together, and he uses what's called, uh, developed what's called folding at home, which is exactly like you're saying, it's a crowd computing resource. The idea is basically that it's a very time-consuming calculation to solve basically Newton's equations of how all the atoms move around and the protein finally folds up into this you know, structure. And so what he does is he farms out these calculations to tens of thousands of computers around the world. They, it kind of runs there as a screensaver, so to speak. And that way you can get actually a lot of computer power together. You know, you have a few tens of thousands of PCs on people's desktops, you know, sitting around the world, you know, doing these calculations. And pretty soon you get some results where you can actually see proteins fold on the computer. Okay, well, that, that, I find that interesting. I think there's a several different kinds of projects that use that uh, technique. I think the SETI people do that. You know, that is right. The SETI people were the first ones, I think, to come up with the idea of basically using people's computers to do a data analysis, let's say, from radio telescopes to actually see if there's some kind of pattern in the signals. We haven't found any aliens yet, but who knows? <laughs> well, Shushana Pillinger, who... Uh, was the uh, on the the women's race of race across America this year, and I we chat back and forth a little bit about her father was Colin Pillager, the world famous astronomer who who uh, was the uh, conceiver and designer of the uh, what is it Rosetta that's now pacing the uh, the comet. I said mathematically there just has to be aliens out there, and she challenged that idea. She had some theory that says, well, there might be, but it's, it's not a mathematical certainty. Yeah. No, it's not a mathematical certainty, but I'll be honest with you, based on everything that I know, and I'm certainly not a, uh, you know, a exobiology expert or anything, but I think you're probably right. <laughs> I'll bet on your side of the bet. Well, you know, and I, I don't know if it'll happen in my lifetime, but I, I just hope that someday we get a signal from outer space of some kind that shows intelligence. Oh, there's Nancy. Hi. Hey. Hi, Nancy. How are you? Good. How are you? <laughs> All the people here in Ohio and around the United States, and indeed we, our audiences around the world, say hello to you. And, and I, I, I give you a quick question, Nancy. Uh, are, are you going to be on Martin's crew? No, I'm no. sorry. <laughs> I'm she's cheering from home. Yeah, she's going to cheer from home and watch me from a distance. <laughs> That's right. But already. She, or maybe she, not much yeah, enough because I yeah. get very scared. She, she shows plenty of tolerance, even just letting me train day in, day out for this sort of stuff. So I'm very lucky. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for loaning him to us, Nancy, for a time each year. I don't think he asked me. <laughs> <laughs> you no, know, the crazy stuff, you just got to do it. <laughs> Well, all right, there, take care. Yeah, there, there has to be a degree of craziness for anybody that's in this, but. Yeah, I think uh, so. Well, th thanks for th thanks, Nancy, for for showing up here. Uh, we we I was in a discussion a day or two ago with somebody in Ram, and, and you know, right now I, I forget who it was who was questioning whether or not family ought to be on crew, and um, sometimes that works, and sometimes it's disastrous. Yeah, family and friends can be a tricky business because uh, you know. You know them reasonably well, but you know you never necessarily have worked with them in in high stress situations or cases where people are sleepless all the time or you know things of that sort. And I'll be completely honest with you: finding a crew for the race in 2016 was really the hardest thing you know for me to do. I I uh, I actually might have ended up racing this year, uh, but I simply could not get the number of people together that I needed. But I finally managed to get a whole crew together of. Uh, uh, you know, six or seven people for, for 2016. So now it looks like a goal. It's always not a bad idea to have a backup just in case because things... Uh, that's right. And I have several people in addition to my core crew that have agreed in principle that they could do backup if needed. Another thing that I found very useful, it certainly saved Jay and me. Uh, last time we did RAM as a team of two in 2013 is to have people standing by that maybe can't do the entire race, but maybe can race part of it. So Jay and I live in Champaign in Illinois. 
And actually, it's basically just a straight drive south to get to Effingham, which is one of the time stations before you get into Indiana and Ohio on the, uh, on the course. And we needed another person in 2013. And sure enough, one of our people that we had talked to that said, yeah, you know, I could, can't do the whole thing, but maybe I can crew for you for the second half if necessary. He was right there, ready to help out, and he really made it possible for us to finish. So backup crew is an important thing, especially because, you know, if they come in partway through the race, they're going to be a lot fresher than the people who started out in Oceanside. <laughs> Well, uh, spending that much time in a couple of vehicles and not getting much sleep, that's a real pressure cooker, and I admire the people who do that. Yes. You already alluded to the fact that you were in a two-person team uh, in 2013, I believe it was. Yep, that's right. And how'd that go for you? It went pretty well for us. Uh, there was a pretty good lineup there, I think maybe something like 11 or so teams. A couple of teams from uh, Denmark, uh, Viking warriors and you know great names like that and Jay and I we went out as Captain America and the honey badger So I already had my honey badger name and the reason our team over here in town in Champaign calls Jay Captain America is because he has a blue white red bike and a blue white red helmet and a blue white and red jersey <laughs> so that seemed like a natural uh, name for him and uh, you know, the race went with pretty smoothly. The weather was cooperating in 2013 pretty well, much better than this year. It was incredibly hot in, in 2015. I'll be totally honest with you. In hindsight, maybe I should actually you know, cross my fingers and, and call my luck that, uh, that I actually didn't find a crew for this year <laughs> and I'm going to go next year. Maybe it's going to be a little bit cooler. Uh, we had a good rate, race across the country. With no major mit mishaps, the usual stuff, of course. You take a little wrong direction once in a while. We had a couple of flat tires, things of that sort. We, of course, all had our times of fatigue or getting grumpy or all those kinds of things that happen when you're sitting on a bicycle you know, for that many hours. But we had a really competent crew that took us you know, through the whole thing. We ended up finishing uh, third uh, in the two-man uh, age 25 to 49 uh, in our rookie year as a, as a two-man team. So we were really quite happy with that when we finally got to Annapolis. And you're still in that age group for... Um... No, I'm now in the uh, 50 age group. Okay. So I've aged up a couple of years. And uh, you know, one of the things that we did differently in 2013 from most of the um, uh, two-man teams, which probably made us a little bit slower, uh, but I think it helped a lot for you know, future solo racing, uh, mostly two-man teams tend to do things like one-hour shifts during the day and maybe four to six-hour shifts at night. And we wanted to make our whole situation a little bit closer to actually doing RAM solo, even though we were doing a two-man team. So what Jay and I did is we actually alternated 12-hour shifts for the first six days of the race. And only in the last day, we went to one-hour shifts and shorter night shifts. So I would typically ride a 12-hour day shift, uh, and then Jay would ride typically a 12-hour night shift. Uh, Jay is a bigger, more powerful rider than I am, so he could get good speed out at night when the temperatures were a little bit lower. I'm a very good climber and I'm very skinny. You know, you can see there's not much on, you know, I can, I can wrap my little finger around my wrist. <laughs> um, so I'm a pretty good climber and I do well in the heat, uh, you know, because I, you know, I'm, I'm pretty skinny. So I basically took the day shifts and rode through the Arizona desert in Colorado, you know, temperatures around 100 and plus degrees. Not as bad as this year. We're only 100 plus in that race instead of 120 or, or temperatures like that. Yeah, well, let's hope we don't have another year like uh, this one because it took a heavy toll medically. And uh, Yes, absolutely. And if you just look at the finish even, right, I mean, half the people or a third of the people or something in the, uh, in the, in the uh, you know, 25 to 49 had to DNF. And I think the majority of people in the 50-plus field actually had to uh, uh, DNF. Hey, and there's uh, Harry. I see him. He was sure enough. in front of him. Hey, sure enough, hey uh, Harry Zink, who's your crew chief, is that correct? Harry was my crew chief for my half of the race in 2013, so he's an experienced guy, and he's going to be my overall crew chief in 2016. Harry, um, we are in your car. Hi there, Lee. In fact, yes, I'm in my car because I just finished my other appointment, and I would not miss it for the world to uh, be calling in. That's good to oh. have you on board. <laughs> it sure is. As, we, we as thought always. We and, and you are in California, I believe. I, I am in Los Angeles, California, correct. So you're going to be crew chief? 
And how's your crew? Sh you're, you're happy with your crew? Is it shaping up well? Um, so far, from what I've seen, it uh, looks like we're, get, we're getting a couple of really cool people together, and I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, to crew chiefing and a great crew once again. Uh, yep, it's nothing like nothing like a good veteran on the on the team. Harry and I, by the way, go back a long, long time. I'd say oh, long 45, way. Years, forty-five years. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what? Tell me again. What your uh, your Gmail your, your z what is it? Zinc different? Oh, Zinc different is a, uh, a funny take on when Apple first rebranded themselves with a new campaign called. Think different. Okay. And uh, many years ago, a friend of mine who's a, uh, a marketing PR guy, and we spent way too much time that night having pizza and him having beer, sp sputtered out, dude, think different. And <laughs> I immediately jumped on Google. It was available. And since then, I, I had think different as a brand. Yeah. And of course, Harry and I both grew up in Austria, in Vienna, in, in Austria, and you know we have these kind of Austrian or German accents. So when I say think differently, it sounds like think differently anyway. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so it works out. Well, glad glad you make it in here, uh, Harry. And for goodness sakes, keep your eye on the road there. Uh, that's more important yeah. than talking to us. So. Well, it's LA, so there's always a traffic jam. So while traffic's jamming, I can look in and give you some eye contact. <laughs> well, and and Harry has a lot of experience driving on narrow roads at 20 miles an hour at three in the morning, keeping his eyes open, looking out that window because. The last thing I need is my crew chief to run me over during the race. <laughs> well, we've been the news with that, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, that has been known to happen, unfortunately. I heard. It's, uh, you know, uh, and uh, keeping your crew awake, Harry, is, uh, and happy is about as important as keeping your cyclists happy. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks to 24-hour shopping, which this country is known for, and a constant supply of... Uh, sodas and coffee, that really worked well the last time. Yeah. And yeah. one thing that I am doing differently uh, in 2016 from the way we had it run in 2013, in 2013 we had basically two crew cars and we had two crews. In 2016 I am going to have three crew vehicles and three crews taking eight hour driving shifts. And uh, Harry's going to take the late night shift, he's a late night guy anyway. And the other exactly. crew drive mostly during the day. So actually, you know, unless there are unforeseen complications, each one of the three crews is going to get uh, seven to eight hours of sleep every day. And so that's why I'm hoping it's really going to help them keep sharp and, you know, uh, drive properly. And, and when I finally go nuts somewhere in Maryland, you know, wanting to drive, ride in the opposite direction or whatever I'm going to do, you know, they're, they're going to have an eye on me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, the the importance of uh, your crew and being in control of you, I guess that's a good way, maybe not a good way to say it, but uh, probably it's what actually is. It's very, very important in being able to watch you because, you know, you kind of live in a bubble, Martin. Yeah. You live in a bubble. The only people that really know what's going on are, are your crew. That's absolutely right. And, you know, I basically, dealt, you know, last time around, and it's going to be the same time thing this time around, of course, I delegate all final authority to Harry as far as making decisions. You know, there could be illness, there could be uh, injuries or accidents. Who knows what can happen out on the road? It's unpredictable when you're riding for 3,000 miles. And uh, Harry is going to basically have the last you know, word on decisions of that nature. Uh, although he does have instructions from me, though, that if I hallucinate and want to turn the wrong way around or whatever, to push me in the right direction. <laughs> <laughs> <That's boring. laughs> yeah, that worked really well last time, so um, I, I think it's pretty good. The way I see it is, is Martin is basically the legs that pedal and, and forge forward, and our job is to make that happen and, and pretty much even out the pathway for him and, and have everything flowing to him that he needs in order to be able to continue on the journey and you know, hopefully end up in a really good position. Now, Mark, uh, I would like you to reflect a little bit. Uh, you have done some other things in cycling besides the race across America. I, I believe, if I remember on your CV, you've done some Ironman. Yeah, that's right. And, and um, how did you qualify for RAM? What did, was your qualifier? 
So the, the, my qualifier for RAM was actually the RAM team. So the two-man team doesn't require a qualifier. Although even before that, I had done an assortment of 12-hour uh, races, 24-hour races, 200-mile races, 100-mile time trials, and, and things of that sort. We've got a couple of guys in town here. Larry Fitz, who was a former Illinois uh, you know, state champion, and Jay Yost, who was my riding partner for RAM in 2013, who really have been doing uh, ultra cycling for quite a long time. And it's basically sometime around 2007 or 2008 that I started uh, tagging around with them and got really interested in uh, ultra cycling, in addition to doing triathlons. Uh, and so, you know, it kind of escalated from there until eventually I graduated from the 12 and 24 hour racing to doing the two man team run in 2013. In, uh, in 2014, I uh, took a year off from uh, the really super long bicycle racing, although I still did a couple of 12 hour races and actually concentrated on Ironman. So I ended up doing uh, 10 Ironman races in, in one year. The bike ride on the Ironman is, of course, only 112 miles, so it's a sh lot shorter than your typical ultra race. But I'll tell you one thing, though. You know, that, that bike ride gets you just tired enough that running a marathon afterwards <laughs> is really something else. Yeah. <laughs> and doing it 10 times in a row definitely got me tired by the end of the year. The good thing was the very last one that I did, uh, the last Ironman, was... Uh, in Cozumel in Mexico, which is a beautiful little tropical island. So, so it was in pretty nice scenery at the end. <laughs> well, Harry is uh, cutting up just a little bit there, but before we lose him all together, we... Um, oh, we're good. Yeah, you're cutting up just a little bit. Uh, we want to thank you for being here with us, Harry. Any last words uh, for us uh, before you uh, before we call this a quit? I think you're still with us. Yeah, I'm still here. Um, uh, the way I see it is, uh, I hope none of us ever have any last words. <laughs> yeah, I got to find meantime, it. In the meantime, I, yeah, yeah, no, I, I sincerely, I, I look, I always look forward to when Martin decides to take us all on an adventure, and uh, and that's really the way to look at it. It's 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 an adventure where you get to see a lot, where you know you everyone gets tested a little bit. Hopefully, next year will be a, a lot more fun with you know an extra car to help out. And uh, I look forward to it, as I always do. It's fun. Well, Harry, we look forward to seeing you here in Ohio. At um, our two time stations here, they're staffed around the clock. So if you come through here at 3 o'clock in the afternoon or 3 o'clock in the morning, there'll be somebody there to <laughs> yell and clap and ring a cowbell. So um, we try to do our best be great. to yeah. help, you guys, help you guys along. Now, i got to find a better way of saying it than last words. Mm. But uh, before we leave... <laughs> Could I say? I don't. Know. Well, anyhow, what what do you have to tell us before we close this show up? Well, I really look forward to next year. It's going to be a lot of fun. I feel preparations are going well. I'm actually doing Paris Brest Paris right now, which is a 750 miler in France, as as one of the you know, things to lead up to it. Uh, I have a really good crew in place, and you know I'm a scientist, so I have a very precise timetable of when I think I'm going to be where. And it turns out we actually stuck to that timetable within an hour and a half across the entire U.S. And I we, we, were, we were incredibly accurate, yeah. Yeah, so uh, in 2013, I visited the time stations in Ohio in the middle of the night, like at 3 or 4 in the morning. But according to my new timetable this time around, we should actually be coming through there, uh, Oxford and so forth, uh, around three in the afternoon, just like what you just said. Okay. So well, actually, yeah. I'm hoping to see you in broad daylight next year. <laughs> well, we'll set our clocks by that, uh, yep. we'll Martin. See. As you know, uh, your plans sometimes uh, get thrown out the window pretty soon, especially if you have 130 degree temperatures. Uh, they can indeed. Uh, one of the things I'm doing uh, in 2016 to help with that, just in case, is my sleep periods are actually all planned for the early afternoon, so that at least cuts out a little bit of that hottest middle of the day riding and replaces it by some night riding. Well, thank you all for being here. Just hang around a little bit after we uh, close the show down because we'll be debrief for a moment. Thanks again, guys, for being on the show tonight. Uh, we want to just say that uh, this is the Ohio Ram Show. There's a lot of information for you at OhioRamShow.com. You can see an archive of all the shows there. You can see future shows. There's a place where you can let us have your email address, and we'll send you uh, notifications of future shows when they air. 
and some other links that you want to take in consideration. We want to thank all of you for being with us. We thank you for your support, your pluses on Google+, Plus, your shares and likes on Facebook, and your retweets on Twitter. All of those help uh, us get to know people like uh, Martin here better, help us get to know the race across America better, help us all get to know uh, more about the wonderful sport of ultracycling. We want to thank you for being with us. And with that, we're going to say good night.